counterparties aren't working right now. Interest rates are only going negative. These derivative books are the reason the Fed is putting a trillion dollars a night into the repo market just to keep things from busting up right in front of us. So everything from the banking sector to the currencies, to the markets, to our own everyday life is up in the air. And I would say to you this, um, is paying eight and a half, nine percent over spot for a gold eagle too much? Well, it was for the last 20 years. Will it be going forward? Can't tell you. Maybe they just aren't available anymore. If the U.S. Mint shuts down in West Point, New York, that's it. The New York Mint, U.S. Mint, and the Canadian Mint are the only two in North America. Those two shut down, it's game over, or we're not allowed to cross borders, or as your other listener was saying, uh, from state to state. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest, Andy Schechtman, the CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. Andy, thanks for joining us this Tuesday, April 7, 2020. Glad to be back, Don again. Thanks for having me. We wanted to get your update on some happenings on the ground, what you're seeing from the coal face or the gold mine face um, in the precious metals markets. Uh, one of the things that, that you and I were talking about earlier in the week was this mysterious disconnect or difference between spot prices or spot price versus futures price specifically for gold. And I've had uh, some exposure to that just recently and some some clients who are actually asking about why they're seeing different actual different spot prices. Can you clue us in as to what you're seeing and what you think it might signify? Yeah, sure. So it's, it's signaling uh, a big problem with the COMEX market first and foremost. So normally, in a normal delivery month, you have between five and 7,000 contracts that stand for delivery, each contract being 100 ounces of gold. This last delivery month of April, there were over 28,000 contracts that stood for delivery. The term rehypothecation is one that people should be aware of, whether you're talking about the repo market issues with the banks not trusting each other, it's rehypothecated collateral, typically treasury bonds, or in this case, the COMEX market, the gold that is stored there is rehypothecated many hundreds of times. I don't know the exact number, but it's over several hundred, meaning if everyone who had a contract at the same time stood for delivery on the COMEX market, one out of every several hundred would get their gold and the rest would be cash settled. It is selling the same asset over and over and over again to the same person. So normally, this works, kind of like a Ponzi scheme or kind of like a Keynesian-based economy. As long as everything is chugging along, everything works just fine. The folks on the COMEX, the people who are buying those um, contracts rarely stand for delivery. The majority of them are cash settled uh, in my business in particular. But in most of the transactions on the COMEX market, it is used to hedge and when the hedge is unwound, it is cash settled. There's no standing for delivery. Well, this time, over 28,000 contracts were standing for delivery. That's over 2.8 million ounces of gold. And the COMEX didn't have that amount of gold. So they rushed to their friends in London. They changed the rules midstream. And the contracts, which allow you to take a 100-ounce gold bar, what the COMEX uses, now say you – if you cash out, you might have to take fractional interest in a 400-ounce gold bar from London. Now, I can't quite figure out how they plan on doing that, cutting it into fourths or what have you, or melting it back down. But none of that is very quick or efficient. And they're, they're, they're saying that, well, and also it's further complicated by the fact that planes aren't flying from London to Chicago. And I, I give that a big BS because uh, when you're talking flying a – uh, a 747 with one pilot and maybe one crew member filled with gold, you don't need to worry about flight restrictions or coronavirus. So if it were really that important to the COMEX market, they could have flown those bars back uh, post haste. Bottom line is, is that there's a disconnection and it's been as high as $50 an ounce uh, just the other day. Uh, and now it's just a few dollars an ounce. It's kind of getting back into into normal, at least for now. But suffice to say, over the last couple of weeks, that disconnection has been anywhere between 20 and $50, whereby London says the price that COMEX is quoting is not real. It's not, it is not a reflection of real gold. It's a paper price. And if you want to convert your paper to the real thing, well, you're not paying enough money for it. So when people are looking at prices, let's say on Kitco, 
more often than not, those prices, at least over the last three, four weeks, have been between $20 and $50 under what it takes to buy it in London. It is, it is decoupling from the London price, which has supposedly a plethora of, of investable gold. Chicago doesn't. And so that's the cracks in the seam, the beginning of the cracks in the seam. Now, if I were a speculator, I would stand for delivery on the next delivery month. And I'm assuming a lot of people will. You get a whole bunch of people to stand for delivery. This is what the Hunt brothers did in 1980 when they saw more contracts than there were ounces of gold, silver in the vaults. You see too many people stand for delivery, you'll see force majeure, you'll see cash settle. settle. You'll see the beginning of the end, perhaps, of the COMEX market being the price-setting mechanism for the world in gold. Another thing that uh, several uh, viewers who have written in are concerned about is the the stability of the U.S. logistical shipping, just as far as different uh, governors saying that they may be uh, not allowing people to travel between states anymore without going to quarantine. Uh, a lot of people that used to be at their places of employment now being forced to work from home, that kind of thing. People are wondering, are shipments going to be continuing and uh, what new information do you have? Are things getting better? Do we see the light at the end of the tunnel as far as some of those restrictions that have been placed on shipments? I'm very concerned about it. In fact, maybe more so than anything, Dunnigan. Uh, everything is supply chain based. Uh, my business is no exception to that. In fact, it's more supply, j uh, supply chain uh, dependent than just about anything. Uh, whether you're talking the very beginning of the supply chain with the mints and, or excuse me, the mines and the refiners, most of which are both shut down, the refiners in Zurich and the mines across the globe, to the mints, which the Canadian mint just opened back up on a limited capacity. The U.S. mint was shut down for a few days last week, is in West Point, New York. Um, how long does that stay open? And then, of course, as you mentioned, the fragility of, of the interstate commerce or the, the, the transportation with UPS or or the post post office. At this point, it's still working. But what's happening, and I, I'd love for your listeners to understand this, even when there are products in stock with some of the suppliers or ourselves, normally we would have 20, 30, 40 or more people packaging up boxes at the big uh, suppliers, the national ones, they have 50, 60, 70 people packing things up. And now with social distancing and trying to keep everything moving without shutting down, those are down to three, four, five people. So everything's jammed up. Everyone's trying to get it out as fast as possible. And I haven't heard anything about UPS uh, or FedEx or the Postal Service, but I've got to be honest with you, I, I am concerned about it. And that's why I've repetitively said that during the, the this whole uh, experiment, uh, if anything does go wrong, uh, we will hold things for free indefinitely in uh, in one of our vaults, fully insured uh, at no cost until such time as uh, people are able to get to, in this case, probably Fargo, North Dakota to pick things up uh, or we're able to ship it again when, when things loosen back up. But at this point right now, we're still trying to get things out as fast as we can uh, and get them to UPS and, and the Postal Service, who is still delivering and and. Uh, I admire them for, for being able to keep things going the way they have been. We have several questions from viewers about the gold to silver ratio. We've talked about some of them in the past, about strategies for uh, overweighting in silver when it's comparatively inexpensive compared to gold as it is at this time historically, and then perhaps shifting back into gold to increase your ounces of gold in the future if, they, if, if the um, ratio reverts to more towards the normal average. Uh, John Volato says... How much gold and silver as a percentage or ratio should we consider owning in our portfolio in today's markets, given what's going on globally now? Should we own more silver than gold right now? Recommended gold-silver ratio we should own, for example, 1 to 2, 1 to 10 today. So again, not personalized financial advice to anybody, but just principles that anybody should think through. Well, I think, you know, in the best of times, people should have 10% of their assets in gold. It's prudent. Um these aren't the best of times. And, um, you know, look, there's nothing that the Fed does is going to matter right now. Uh, and, and the Fed is, is whether they cut interest rates, uh, no matter how much money they print and throw at this, it isn't going to matter. And I think they're going to do that. They're going to do all they can to continue to print money and lower interest rates and do whatever they can to, to fight this problem. So when we talk about 
what's going to happen and how much gold should we own? Well, look, we're a Keynesian-based economy that is centered around consumption, spending, and debt. The Fed is going to do all they can in the Treasury to keep throwing money at things, but it doesn't matter how much money is thrown at this. What is go- what's it going to take to get people out consuming and spending again? And that's really the biggest issue. And so what you have is the Federal Reserve destroying the currency by inflating it away, hyperinflating away the currency, trying to hyperinflate global de- deflation. And this global deflation and hyperinflation meeting is going to create what I believe is the most painful of all scenarios, and that is hyperstagflation. If you notice, when the market seems to pop up every day, the stock market, very often within a day or two, it's down by equal amount or more. And to me, that is the Fed pushing it up and the insiders pulling out and selling. And when that happens, for the very first time in 12 years, you have what was asset price inflation. All the easy money has created bubbles and stocks and bonds and real estate, This volatility and this great awakening that people had to a 30% decline in their value in two weeks, I think has um, uh, given people a different perspective on things. And so each time we see it go up, the selling, the voracious selling to me is concerning. That is, to me, insiders pulling their money out, chasing things. And now you have price inflation in a broken supply chain environment. So I'm going to answer this question in a roundabout way. This Price inflation in precious metals has created premiums in silver that I've never seen before. Huge premiums. And if the supply chain doesn't get fixed anytime soon, those premiums will only go higher, making the gold to silver ratio thing a little bit more challenging. But I'm very concerned about the market, the stock market. I'm very concerned about the US dollar. Um, And I think so in times like this, when there's great uncertainty, Uh, When the Fed and the Treasury Department have proven they will do all they can by opening up the spigots and pouring money on top of this deflationary tidal wave that's uh, roaring down upon us, um, I think that all bets are off in terms of asset allocation models and what is considered prudent. And I would simply say in times of great uncertainty, I feel far more comfortable having a much more robust allocation to 5,000-year-old history, to wealth. Uh, to gold and silver that are the only items really that I can think of that are not simultaneously someone else's liability. Uh, And in a period of time where all currencies are being inflated in an effort to fight this off, I think a a much bigger position in precious metals are warranted. And I say that with all the objectivity I can muster. I can't can't think of any other place I put my own money. And uh, for that reason, I think A, you put more in than you normally would. Hmm. Allocation models you should throw out. And as far as the gold to silver ratio, silver is the most undervalued asset on the planet. But with the premiums you're paying right now, it's closer to $22, $23, $24 silver. That's what the industry is saying, Mm -hmm. making that ratio not quite as appealing as it once was. For all of your people who are overweighted in silver, I would suggest switching to gold once that ratio hits 42, 43, 44 to 1, But for people trying to do that right now, you're going to kind of be counterfeited by the fact that the premiums on these coins are two to three to four times higher than I've ever seen in 30 years of business. So uh, it sounds like you're leaving people still having to think it through for themselves as far as, yes, overweight what you normally would look at in precious metals in general, but as far as balancing between gold and silver, not a clear signal. Not a clear signal because there's been such an incredible demand for silver that everyone sold out of it. And so I have 15,000 silver eagles on their way to me, hopefully in two weeks, but I'm paying premium three times what I normally do right. just to be able to offer them to people. Right. And so that's the only thing that has to be kept in mind. And, and, I, and I say this to people, look, is it too much or isn't it? Well, it sure is if things get normal, like in 08, which was a V-shaped recovery which the Fed stepped in and goosed the markets and, and, and liquefied things, and boom, here we are. Everything's great. But this isn't about liquidity. This isn't about lowering interest rates. The Fed can do all they want. This would be like if there was a, a wildfire in California and the Fed said, I'm going to lower interest rates and throw money at everyone. Would that put out the fire? It's just as ridiculous as to think that all of this easy money and Fed-induced um, goosing can uh, make people feel comfortable about a global pandemic. And so this is something we've never been in. And so as it as it pertains to the markets, as it pertains to the supply chain, as it pertains to the mines opening back up, the refineries, 
the mints, all of these things are in flux and very fluid. And, and I have never in all of my years had to roll with the changes quite the way we have now. A month ago, look at how different the world looked than it does today. What will it look like next month? Nobody knows. And so for this reason, you have to ask yourself, is this just like every other time? My answer is hell no. It's not anything like we, anything anyone's ever experienced. People say, well, what about 1918? Yeah, 1918, there was another pandemic, but people weren't traveling all over the world and, and there weren't $285 trillion in global debt that we see right now, most of which is owned by the banks. Uh, and that doesn't even take into account the quadrillion dollars in derivatives that are all busting right now because of their assumptions on interest rate and counterparties' abilities to make good. Counterparties aren't working right now. Interest rates are only going negative. These derivative books are the reason the Fed is putting a trillion dollars a night into the repo market just to keep things from busting up right in front of us. So everything from the banking sector to the currencies to the markets to our own everyday life is up in the air. And I would say to you this. Um, is paying eight and a half, nine percent over spot for a gold eagle too much? Well, it was for the last 20 years. Will it be going forward? Can't tell you. Maybe they just aren't available anymore. If the U.S. Mint shuts down in West Point, New York, that's it. The West Point or the New York Mint, U.S. Mint and the Canadian Mint are the only two in North America. Those two shut down, it's game over or we're not allowed to cross borders or as your other listener was saying, uh, from state to state. So all of these things are in flux, and it's for that reason that I don't have a problem paying three times what I normally do to buy stuff to sell. I just had a very large distribution from last year that I just got at the beginning of April. I put it all into Gold Eagles. I didn't care what the amount was. I don't care what the premium is. I don't feel comfortable putting my money anywhere else right now. I'm not the poster child for Finance 101. Nowhere near it. What I really believe people should have in precious metals, if I said that, I would lose my – uh, any credibility. But I simply will tell you this, that I do not feel comfortable having my money anywhere else right now with all of the uncertainty. And what the Fed and the Treasury are trying to do to stave this off is is destroying the currency right in front of us. So let alone what's going to happen to the stock markets, the derivative markets, the banks themselves. The Fed and the, and the Treasury are hell-bent on, on inflating away our problems, which I don't think will work. It will only destroy the currency and create hyperinflation hopefully not hyperstagflation, which is what I think will happen. Little or no growth, rising prices, uh, it's the most painful of all. It's depression and it's inflation at the same time. Everyone's out of work, prices are going up, and the big wealthy people who pulled all their money out of the market out of fear chasing what few goods and items are available. And it's happening in this market right now. You can hardly find gold and silver. And um, and, and in order to do it, you got to spend a lot more and be a lot more creative. So does it continue? I don't know, Don. Again, I hope not. I really do. I would trade all of this right now to go back to normal life in what it was like in November. I would. I'd trade it all right now. All the business I did, six months worth of business in March, I'd give it all back right now. I'd donate it to a food shelf if I could go back to November and watch the NCAA with you and have a beer. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just a situation where I'm very concerned on all levels from the very, very beginning, whether you're talking – uh, the, who makes the gold, who pulls it out of the ground, who refines it all the way to the very end, who delivers it to your door. Everything in between I'm concerned about and growing more so every day, quite frankly. Uh, you've probably answered about two-thirds of this next question from reduced effort. At what gold-to-silver ratio would you recommend exchanging silver coins for gold coins? And when it is time to exchange, will gold coins be available? That's another, another good question. Uh, I would hope so. They always have been. But again, this is a whole new reality. And that's the question people need to ask themselves. What, how does this whole new reality express itself? I mean, I, I don't think any of us saw this coming. I saw uh, destruction of this system a long time ago. I've been in this business for 30 years, never would have dreamt it would be like this. But as far as the answer normally, normally I'd say the average ratio over the last 150 years is 45 to 1. You get anywhere near regression to the mean. Right now, your, your one ounce or, or what you could trade into gold right now will be three times that much when we regress to the mean. And, and that happens quickly. In 2010, we had 85 to 1 or thereabouts. By 2011, we had $48 silver and almost $2,000 gold, basically um, 40 to 1. And so 50, 50 silver and 2,000 gold, basically 50 or 40 to 1. So um, 
yeah, we'll see it again, and it will happen very quickly. And when it does, I would trade the gold. Will there be gold coins available? Who knows? Not in this environment, probably not. Um, one thing that I am noticing, again, is what I was talking about. I've been getting phone calls from people who I may know in the, in, here in the Twin Cities, uh, people who I've talked to before, once or twice in, in, through my business. They're on my database, not much to say on them. They, they've talked with me once or twice before over the last 10, 15, 20 years. They know what I do. And now they're calling me asking to place two, three, four, five million dollar orders. Just like that. That is where we get the price inflation. These people who I'm talking to are scared. They're pulling out of their 401ks. They're pulling out of their IRAs and they're trying to protect their money. And this is what we've never seen before. It's this type of action waking back up to the mainstream. And as we've talked before on every show, the average allocation to precious metals in 1980 was 8%. Right now it's one half of 1%. Over those 40 years, the mean average is two and a half percent. We regress to the mean. That's a five-fold increase in metals from the American public. Good luck on getting anything if that happens. I'm dead serious on that. I won't be able to buy anything for myself. There'll be nothing to have if things don't get better anytime soon. And the problem with that, if things don't get better, I'm talking about the supply chain. If things get worse with the stock market, this hyperinflationary, hyperstagflationary, or shall I say asset price uh, inflation changing to price inflation will happen like that. People will just bail out of the stock market and look to put their money anywhere safe. And that's the thing. The place to put your money safe is becoming harder and harder to get. You pay more money for it. And again, I'll go back to the same answer. Do you see it changing anytime soon? If it does, then hold tight. Go into cash. Put your money into cash. Sit on the sidelines. Get out of the market. Watch what happens. You're fine. Um, if it doesn't, change anytime soon, then in six weeks, this market will be void of product altogether. I, I really believe that to be true. You, what you just mentioned this story about uh, large uh, net worth individuals uh, starting to protect themselves and that, that awakening of mind, mind share. Uh, Edward Solozano says, why has not the average millionaire taken a small position in gold or silver? How do I know they haven't? Of course, everything would be gone long ago. <laughs> Uh, that's because most of the people who have that kind of money work with financial advisors. And I'm not trying to paint a broad swath of of a financial advisor, but I think most financial advisors don't want to tell their clients to go and buy physical gold because um, the way that financial advisories make money is keeping it under management. And when you pull that kind of money out of management, it's never coming back if it's going into gold. So they'll tell people to buy GLD and SLV. Which I do believe, by the way, will be the tool of confiscation. If the government wants to come in and take our gold and silver, it would be far better and far easier for them to come in overnight on a Friday night, confiscate GLD, which is the fourth or fifth largest stockpile of gold in the world, confiscate SLV, which is the second largest stockpile of silver in the world. And oh, by the way, SLV is held by J.P. Morgan as the administrator. Talk about the fox guarding the hen house and GLD by HSBC Bank, two of the big cartel banks. And so come in on a Friday night, take those two accounts, pay everyone their fair share in dollars, what their accounts are worth. That's now in your money market. And they say, we didn't break any laws or infringe any civil liberties. You can still go buy physicals through a company like Miles Franklin. So the point of it is, is that I think that uh, I think that GLD and SLV are the tools of confiscation, and uh, I think that most of the big money has who owns precious metals has gone into GLD and SLV because the first person they ask is their broker, and their broker will say, here's a better way to do it. You don't have to pay storage fees. You don't have to worry about someone breaking into your home. We'll keep it under your management here. And for a lot of people, that's fine until you try to take possession of it, and you can't. And so to me, uh, I think more and more people are waking up to it. I've been getting lots more calls from people who are throwing around those kinds of numbers where in years past, even doing $250 million a year, you only get a couple dozen seven-figure orders during a year. Most of them are you know, mid-six figures, a huge order. And, and our average order has always been about $20,000. Some are much less, some are much more. But now you're getting people who have never dipped their toe in the water and throwing around four, five, six million dollars. And that's something this industry is not ready for and has not experienced because right now 
there's hardly enough for the choir. I keep mentioning mm-hmm. that on your show, mm-hmm. the choir and the choir has been stuffing their pockets, uh, you know, uh, crazy with how much they've been buying. But now all of a sudden their friends and family are waking up to it. And uh, my friends and family, people here that I have known what I have done for 30 years, none of them ever <laughs> talked to me about it ever. And now they're all calling. They're all calling and asking about that and where they can buy guns. And so and to me, that's a, that, that tells you what's going on in, in the community. People who wouldn't know a gun if it dropped on their foot or a gold coin if it dropped on their foot are now asking me, what do I think about this? And people here in the Twin Cities. And to me, that's the beginning of, of, of a great awakening and a great sea change in what uh, people are doing with their assets and protecting. You know, then again, they say there's no bull market like a gold bull market. Do you know why they say that? No. Yeah. Because every other bull market speaks to people's desire to make money, greed. But the mm-hmm. other motivator is fear. And the higher the price goes or the scarier things get, nobody sells. In a traditional bull market in equities, you're taught to sell and play with the house's money once you double your money, take half and play with their money. Here, no one does that. What are you going to do? Go back into dollars when things are scary as they are? So product isn't coming back. Of all of the business we've done since the middle of February, we have less than five buyback orders total. And we've done thousands of orders. So the price is irrelevant. The price is just a tool for the big banks to manipulate. The price is what has enabled them to amass enormous quantities of physical metal. And I always go back to Why would the central banks reclassify gold as the only tier one asset in the world a year ago, if not for it to be part of their long game? Why, why, why? That is the most important thing to remember. Who cares what the price is? The most powerful people in the world reclassified gold as the only other tier one asset in the world since Bretton Woods, next to U.S. dollars and treasuries. That tells you what their long game is. So in terms of allocations, the better question to ask is, how much money do you want in a currency that's $120 trillion in debt and the Fed is, is adding 6 or 7 or $8 trillion to it this year alone? So, yeah, the big money is waking up to that. The big money is starting to realize that, that equities and mutual funds aren't as liquid as what they once thought and aren't as safe as they once thought. And you know what? Maybe they're getting older. Maybe they're baby boomers. Maybe it's time to to listen to someone like you or to someone like me and to realize that the road to retirement might be paved with gold bricks, not just mutual funds and stock certificates. And I I mean that tongue in cheek, but I mean that in sincerity. There has been for the last 20 years, if all you had done is put your money into stocks, you'd be just fine. And you would think that that's the only way to do it. And I don't blame people for that. They've done well, but everything is a cycle. And, uh, you know, when there was an 8% allocation, to precious metals. That was the last time we saw a one-to-one ratio on the Dow and gold at 800. There are a lot of people that that I talk to think that you'll see those two cross again, maybe at 10,000, maybe at 5,000. I don't know. But history has a funny way of rhyming. It doesn't always repeat, but it rhymes. And I think that to believe that this time is not different, I think you're making a mistake. For the very first time, this is different, at least what we're facing. And so all of these markets that have become, we've all become so accustomed to riding out. It, even the best laid plans done again have to be re-evaluated, some, re-evaluated sometimes. And right now, allocation models, um, trusting your gut, uh, not listening maybe as much to your financial advisor and to your gut, these are things that have to be confronted right now, uh, like being a reluctant prepper, you know? And the term is fantastic. You have to prepare. And, and, and you say it's reluctant because a lot of people are reluctant to confront these realities. Right. And that's what it's about. It's confronting this reality. Is it a new reality or not? I, I'm beginning to think that it is a new reality for a while until it's not. And that's how I'm reacting accordingly, whether it be with my own allocation to precious metals or to preparing for my family with food and medicine and that kind of stuff, which I did in December when this came about. Um, and I, and I understand the reluctant part of it, but that's what has to be done here, too. You have to reluctantly ask yourself, is this going to get better anytime soon? What's going to make people get out and spend and mingle and hug and shake hands and get on airplanes and take cruises and sleep in hotel beds? I don't know. I don't know what it is. And I can promise you this. It has nothing to do with how much money the Fed gives us all and what they do with interest rates. It's a lot deeper than that. And that's really the question that I keep asking myself over and over and over again. And and where does this end? I don't know. How does it end? Don't know. 
there's a cluster of questions around people looking forward to when they might want to um, make sure that, you know, like you mentioned, when prices uh, can move suddenly, then premiums can suddenly go up. And, and some people are concerned about, well, would they be able to ever sell back or they have to sell for far below spot if they ever did. Uh, Simone Bivan uh, says, uh, what can you talk about the bid price for buybacks? And I was uh, impressed because in chatting with some of the guys at the Bullion Exchange, there are some significant uh, positive above spot buybacks always. that they're offering. Yeah. So we've always been one of the highest bid prices, if not the in America, always. And I give on like on swaps when someone trades their gold to silver, we don't make anything. We just take the value and apply it to the trade. There's no reason to steal from Peter to pay Paul. So, yeah, the bid prices right now are very high. On Gold Eagles, we'll pay you over 4% over spot. Anyone who's paying you in this environment below spot, never talk to them again. They're stealing from you. Um, if you're paying, you know, 8% over spot to buy a Gold Eagle or 9%, it, you should at least get 4 5 6% over. Now, I'm guessing. I know for sure they're over 5 maybe or 4 maybe 5 maybe 6 No one's selling. But I promise you that if you were selling Silver Eagles right now, you'd get several three, four, five, six dollars over the price of silver. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, the bid prices will rise with with the ask prices. Absolutely, hundred um, percent. In fact, I know of nothing right now selling for below spot. Nothing. Even thousand ounce bars are bid above spot right now. So anyone who's selling and getting those kind of crummy bid prices, give you or give me a call. And we will make sure they get the highest bid price in America. That that's an easy easy for sure. Another concern, and with this kind of uh, circles back to something we talked about earlier about the fragility potentially of the supply chain given the unknown landscape of uh, potential restrictions and that sort of thing that are going to be happening. Arizona Steve uh, is, I think, asking a question that a lot of the that of the clients are concerned about right now. If they're thinking, if I go and start to purchase, other than from my local shop, which is sold out, so I can't. But if I purchase from a, from a dealer um, and I'm waiting for my medals to uh, my order to be fulfilled, how can I? They, they're they're a bit anxious. They're they're wanting to see updates and status and and be able to see, have have visibility that things are moving forward and, and progressing. Um, how can they uh, how can they get that that sense of reassurance in this uncertain environment of where the status of their order is at? No, it's it's really it's very difficult dealing with this every day and I'm dealing with it all day long and I don't blame people. I don't. Um, the Royal Canadian Mint is a prime example, Dunning, and I, I, I bought 42,000 silver maple leaves and then the mint shut down four days later and I paid the money um, and people paid me. Where the heck's my silver maple leaves? They want to know. Well, the mint is closed down. What can I do? So yeah, so everything in this industry is done on relationships and on trust. And so uh, typically when I buy things from the Royal Canadian Mint, like we did uh, three and a half weeks ago, 42,000 silver maple leaves, um, then the mint shut down. Now we are reliant upon the mint to open back up and ship us that product. People want to know where their stuff is. Uh, when I buy from one of the three or four largest distributors in the world, or when I buy from a coin shop in New Jersey, or when I buy from a small distributor in, in Palm Beach, it doesn't matter where I'm buying it from. I'm reliant upon them packaging it up with skeleton crews with 50 times more demand than they've ever had and shipping it in, a, in this crazy environment. And then we get it. We have to open it up, check the veracity, make sure everything's in good condition, rebox it, and ship it with 50 times more demand and a skeleton crew. And whether you're talking JM Bullion, SD Bullion, Atmex, or Miles Franklin, you're going to get it. All of these companies are legit, um, and you'll get it. But what's happened is that the supply chain that we deal with has become gummed up with so much demand and so few people. And if we were to have a full staff doing it as normal and one person gets sick, the whole place gets shut down for a couple of weeks, it's all deep cleaned, and then what? What good does that do? So everyone is working overtime, most of us from home, like myself, my whole staff from home, and the people who are packaging, packaging it are the only people in the warehouses uh, working long hours, doing the very best they can to keep up. And it goes all the way through the whole supply chain from where we get it, whether it be the mint or a, a refiner somewhere 
or um, another dealer or a coin shop. All of it has to go through the same process. Pack up, send it to us, unpack, repack, send it. And it's all happening in a gummed up manner. I would say simply this. We've never not delivered ever, ever in 30 years. And I would say any of these reputable dealers online, they won't disappoint either. But we're all facing the same challenges and the same problems. And I would say it's all legitimate. Patience is tough to do. Uh, it's a hard thing to do when you're frightened. I get it. Everyone's anxiousness is is legitimate. Um, but I would say I would, if I had to guess, if you're buying from a major distributor like us, like SD Bullion, like JM Bullion, like Atmex, any of us four for sure, you're going to get it. There's a fine line in life between penny wise and pound foolish. And I would never buy from uh, any dealer who doesn't have a great reputation. It's easy to Google and find out. Uh, we're proud of our reputation, Dunnigan. We've never had a complaint in 30 years. We're A plus rated. We're one of only 24 companies that the U.S. Mint uh, recommends. All sorts of things that we're proud of. And these are easy to find out. But in the end, which, you know, I hang my hat on it, but those are very important traits. And if you've been around for a long time, you have a good reputation, I would say to you the only thing right now that is keeping you from getting your medal is the gummed up supply chain, which is legitimate. And I'm still waiting for stuff that should have been in two weeks ago, and it's not in. And so I call the distributors. Where is it? Oh, sorry, we had, we're so backed up. We just got it out. And it's it's a waiting game, but everyone has best intentions of delivering. The one thing I would like to make really well known is almost everyone you see online doesn't have the stuff in their warehouse. None of them do. They all buy it from other suppliers, big suppliers, who then fill these orders white labeled for these online companies. So when these online companies get your money or when we get your money, very often, if I don't have it in stock, we normally have a very big inventory. Well, that was exhausted in February. All of these online people, they don't have these things in stock. Um, they buy them from distributors or mints who do propose to have them in stock or purport to have them in stock. And that's the trust factor. So all of these players who all of us buy our product from, we have to pay up front. So the point I'd like to get across to your listeners is that when they pay us, we're not playing with their money. We immediately pay for the product. We hedge it and pay for it if it's not in our warehouse. So we don't have the money either. The big distributors do. The U.S. Mint does. The Royal Canadian Mint does. And we're waiting for them also. And they've always performed admirably. All of them have. Normally, this stuff I get within two or three days of placing an order. These just aren't normal times. And of course, right after we made a very large purchase with the Mint, they shut down for two weeks. No communication at all. You know, and, and now they open back up on a limited basis. And so they're, they said they're going to get our stuff out to us. But it should have been here 10 days ago. So that's the point. It's it's yes, you'll get your stuff, but it's uh, one of these deals where you're going to have to wait probably longer than you would like to. But it's of no fault of the dealer whom you bought it from. If us or anyone else, we're all trying our darndest to get this done quickly. Well, Andy, thanks for taking this time out of your evening. I know that you have very long working days, and we don't want to keep you up any longer. But our viewers appreciate because they've they flood us with questions every time so that people really want to understand what's going on. It helps to get uh, kind of the the uh, word from the trenches. Thanks for joining us again on Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. I really do appreciate it. I hope to be back next week. And if there's ever something that uh, pops up as being very important for an impromptu get-together, feel free to uh, buzz me and uh, I'll jump on anytime. Thanks, Andy. You bet. Good to see you, Dunnigan. Be well. You too. If you've decided that now is the right time for you to protect your family's financial future by acquiring physical precious metals, gold and silver, I'm delighted to let you know that I have now become a licensed dealer's representative for Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in bullion dealerships. And we can provide you with physical delivery to your personal possession or to professional vault storage or precious metals IRAs. Just email me at Liberty and Finance at ProtonMail.com and please include your name and phone number in your email to Liberty and Finance at ProtonMail.com. We'll get right back with you and find out how to best meet your needs so that you can either begin or increase your acquisition of physical precious metals now. 
and protect your family's future starting today.